my lord. <laughs> He has covered me with the robe of righteousness, as a bridegroom decks himself like a priest with a beautiful headdress, and as a bride adorns herself with her jewels. For as the earth bring forth, brings forth its sprouts, and as a garden causes what it sown in it to sprout up, so the Lord God will cause righteousness and praise to sprout up before all the nations. First Peter 2, 24 and 25. He himself bore our sins in his body on the tree, that we might die in sin and live to righteousness. 
by his, by his wounds you have been healed, for you were straying like sheep, but have now returned to the shepherd and overseer of our souls. Let's pray. Father, we do rejoice today for how you've carried us through this past year and how you've promised to carry us through this coming year. Father, I pray that you would bless us today as we worship together in song. I pray that you would fill Pastor Billy with your Holy Spirit as he brings the word today to us. And I pray especially for anyone that does not know you, Lord, as their Savior that their hearts would be open to you today. And I ask all these things in Jesus' precious name. Amen. 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 Let's worship with us this morning. Jesus paid it all.
a time of corporate prayer together. And uh, Jacob, uh, who is going to come and lead us through our prayer time, Jacob is uh, in our pastoral uh, internship program, and he'll lead us through our prayer time. But uh, as he's going to come up, uh, I just want to also point out a, a few things that uh, uh, for you to be praying about. In your in your bulletin, in your worship guide, you go a few pages in, uh, there's just a list of things that you can pray for during this time. And uh, Jacob will also end up uh, asking some of you who are with us uh, your church names, and so we can be praying for your churches and unreached peoples. But uh, this Brenda was sharing with me that there was uh, somebody on the island um, that had a bad car accident, I think it was last night, is that correct? And so, what was her name again? Deanna Goldsby, uh, uh, I guess she works over at Steam, as many of you are familiar with her. So, um, it sounds like it's, it's pretty bad. And so, be praying for her as well. We have quite a few, as you can look around and see, we have quite a few who are out with uh, sickness right now, quite a few who are uh, traveling. So, these are the things you'd be lifting up during this time. Uh, Brent? She passed away. She yeah. I talked to her husband this morning. Uh, so. Lee Brown was her name. Oh, right, Lee, Lee Brown is his name. She yeah. Man. She ended up passing. Mm -hmm. So you want to lift up the the family, of course, and peace for all of them. It's definitely hard this time of year. Jake, would you come up now and lead us through that uh, corporate prayer time? Like Pastor Billy was saying, uh, we'd like to pray for other churches uh, in the area and around the world and any lost people groups um, that for the missionaries and then that the ears will be open for those who do not know the gospel. They should come here up on the screens. Um, Y'all can pray for those. And is there any churches um, that are visiting today? Children Orthodox Presbyterian Church and Community Bible Baptist Church, Barbara Clark. Emmanuel Southern Baptist Church in Southern Illinois. Faith Community Church, Tell City Island. And if there's no more, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we come before you to rejoice in another day, another breath, to praise you, to corporately come together. I rejoice in seeing all of our brothers and sisters from different churches, Lord, that they're willing to come and worship with us. Lord, I pray that you bless them, that you strengthen the preachers of those churches, Lord God, that you equip them and all those who are helping in the function of the church, Lord, and all the congregation that they know their parts and their roles, Lord God, and they know that it's an act of worship to you on how they conduct themselves in the church. So prepare each one of us today as we come to worship, Father, that you just clear our minds, take every distraction, every fear, every doubt, anything that we're worried about this afternoon. Lord God, that we submit it to you and lay it at your feet. Lord God, that we come boldly before your throne, that you hear our prayers, Lord God, that you hear our songs, and that you minister to our souls as Pastor Billy preaches. Lord, let us retain it, let us receive it, and let us apply it, Lord. Let it be a blessing to you and an act of worship as we leave here, as we live out the words that you teach us, Father, through your Bible, and that we help have the boldness to proclaim it to our families if they're visiting for the new year, Lord, and then as the temptation comes to look like the world and do what the world does, that we stand firm and we don't look like the world, Lord, that we show that our pleasure and our joy comes from you, Holy Spirit, and not from pleasures of this world, that we are a light in a, the darkness, Father. I pray for the family that just lost a loved one, Lord, and anyone else that's lost a loved one. In this season, Father, that you strengthen them and minister to them, Father. And if they don't know you, Lord, that they know you through this, that the body and the hands and feet are used to minister, that they can see the light and the love that you have for them, Father. So if we know of anything we can do to help those that are mourning, Lord, let us be ambassadors for you and care and mourn with them, Father. So give us that strength to be with Pastor Billy as he is going to give us your word to speak through the Holy Spirit. Let him step out of the way and let you speak. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 For uh, the normal church comers, you know I am not a typical person to stand up here and lead worship. That is Tom, but 
we decided to give Tom the week off so he could go back to Arkansas and do Arkansas <coughs> things, like biscuits and chocolate gravy. <laughs> <laughs> it's a big thing over there. But please stand and sing Al Firm Foundation.
serving the nursery, go ahead head over that direction. If you're dropping off the one in the nursery, go out these doors around to the right and up the stairs. They should be there to help you. you to take your copy of God's holy and inspired word and turn to Philippians chapter 3. Philippians chapter 3. If you do not have a Bible today, there should be a few Bibles in front of you or beside you. It should be around page 981 in the few Bible. 981 in the few Bible. man comes into my office for a scheduled counseling session. We're to sit down and we're to talk because his marriage isn't going so well. Not really his idea to meet with me, believe it or not. The wife wanted him to. The wife wanted him to come and talk with Pastor Billy. He thinks Everything's pretty much okay. But she has some concerns. He says, I love her. I don't know what the big deal is. She says, I don't really feel like he loves me. So we sit down together and I begin to ask questions to try to hear his side of the story. And as we talk, find out that he really doesn't like to spend much time with her. He goes to work, and when he comes home, he likes to eat and then just go and do his own thing until bedtime. She goes off to bed alone, and it's just a cycle that repeats over and over and over again. So a little bit of concern, don't really like to spend time together. And I say, well, what about, like, you know, just, just talking? Do you guys just talk about stuff? Do you just get together and, you know, talk about future plans or hopes or dreams or anything? No, not really. I don't really like to talk to her that much. A lot of times there's just nagging. I don't like to really listen to her much. Okay, so you don't spend much time together. You don't talk or listen. You guys get together with other people, like friends or family? No, I don't really like her family. I don't really like her friends. Oh, don't want to be with the friends, don't want to be with the family, don't want to talk, don't want to listen, don't want to spend time. I said, well, I'm starting to see a problem. I said, how would, you, how would you get to know her more and more? How would you continue to grow and, and, and learn about your life and your marriage? He goes, well, she gave me a book. It's like a journal of hers. It talks all about her what she likes and what she doesn't like, what her desires are, her background, her history, all kinds of stuff right in here that I could learn about. And she gave it to me and asked me to read it. I don't like to read. It's hard. Needless to say, that was a challenging first session. The disconnect that's going on between the husband and the wife is similar to the disconnect that we have as Christians. Go on. The Apostle Paul is going to address some of these things in chapter 3 of Paul's letter to the church of Philippi. For those of you who have not been with us, the last four weeks we've had Advent season where we were preparing our hearts for Christmas. And we had different topics. We were going through the Psalms together. That's not something we normally do. We normally go through the Bible verse by verse, chapter by chapter, to understand uh, the Bible in context. So before Advent season, we had started Paul's letter to the church at Philippi. 
So let me refresh you for just a few minutes for those who have uh, been with us, but you just, uh, it's been a few weeks since we've been in the letter. For those who are guests today, let me catch you up to where we are in chapter 3. The Apostle Paul started this church through a prison ministry. He was arrested, he and a guy named Silas, and they were in prison. And even though they were in prison and they were suffering, they were singing hymns and they were praising God, and then a miraculous thing happened, an earthquake took place, and they had the ability to escape if they wanted to, but they didn't. And we talked about that Sunday, how just because something is an open door doesn't mean you should walk through it. <coughs> and so they did not leave when they were in this jail cell. And the jailer who thought they had left was about to kill himself, and Paul said, don't do that. We're still here. And that guy became a Christian. And his family became a Christian. And the church was started in Philippi. About ten years later, the Apostle Paul is writing back to that church in Philippi. But now he's in a different prison. He's in a Roman prison. And that's where our letter comes from. And so in chapter 1, the Apostle Paul writes and he greets them. And he encourages them. And he gives thanksgiving. And he prays for them. And he thanks them for their partnership in the gospel. From the first day until now. He tries to reassure them that even though he's in prison again, they don't need to worry that God is still using him. Over 9,000 hear the gospel with him in the jail cell in Rome. And in fact, as he's in jail, other people are becoming more and more bold. Other Christians are going, wow, look at Paul suffer, and they're getting more and more bold. And there are even those who are out there preaching the gospel, and they're preaching it rightly, except they're doing it just to try to make trouble for Paul. They're doing it out of jealousy, and Paul says, you know what, I don't even care. They may be doing it out of bad motives, but as long as Christ is preached, then I rejoice. He moves on to explain that he's, he's not sure what's going to happen to him. He thinks that he's going to live. But for him, if he dies, that's better anyway. See, for the Christian... This world is as bad as it gets. And so he says, it's game for me to die ago. For the non-Christian, this world is as good as it gets. He says, I, I'd rather go and be with Jesus, but I'm supposed to stay around for a while to minister to you, church at Philippi, and other churches. <laughs> so while I'm living, for me to live is Christ. My life will be Christ-centered. Everything is about Jesus. Everything rotates around Jesus. As he's writing, he's aware that there's some disunity in this church. There's disunity in the church of Philippi because people are being prideful. People want it their way. They're not willing to bend for others. So as he's talking about the Gospel in chapter 2, he talks about the humility of Christ. He talks about Jesus and he uses it as an example. He says, Jesus, God the Son Eternal, gave up that, that glory to come as a human. To come and suffer and humble himself. And to suffer and die for us. And he used that to say, if Jesus, the King of glory, is willing to do that, then we should be willing to be humble and serve others. He then shifts to explain that because Jesus has done this great thing, that we are to be a people who are lights to the world. We're to be a people who do all things without grumbling or disputing. And even though many of you want that verse to say something different. Do some things without grumbling or disputing. It says all things. He says that it's God who works in us. It is God by His Spirit who is working in us to will and work for God's good pleasure. It's this incredible mystery of how God must work in us and we also have responsibility. God's sovereign work and our human responsibility, we must work together to grow, to be sanctified, to look more and more like Jesus. He says you want to look more and more like Jesus, and sometimes you need to find human examples of people who are doing it pretty well. Nobody's perfect, so he points out Timothy and Epaphroditus as two guys who are doing a pretty good job. Watch them closely, he says. 
And I encourage you to find people in the faith that you can watch who, even though they're not perfect, to the degree that they follow Jesus, you follow them. It gives you real examples to see. And then that takes us to chapter 3, to where we are today. Follow along silently as I read the 11 verses that I hope for us to cover today. And we will look and see what God may have for us as we're on the eve of the new year. I've titled the sermon for today, A Year of Loss and a Year of Gain. A Year of Loss and a Year of Gain. The Apostle Paul writing, Philippians chapter 3, beginning in verse 1. Finally, my brothers, rejoice in the Lord. To write the same things to you is no trouble to me and is safe for you. Look out for the dogs. Look out for the evildoers. Look out for those who mutilate the flesh. For we are the circumcision who worship by the Spirit of God and glory in Christ Jesus and put no confidence in the flesh. Though I myself have, have reason for confidence in the flesh also. If anyone else thinks he has reason for confidence in the flesh, I have more. Circumcised on the eighth day of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, as to the law, a Pharisee. As to zeal, huh, a persecutor of the church. As to righteousness under the law, blameless. Verse 7, but whatever gain I had, I count as loss for the sake of Christ. Indeed, I count everything as loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. For His sake I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish or trash in order that I may gain Christ and be found in Him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which comes through faith in Christ, the righteousness from God that depends on faith, that I may know Him and the power of His resurrection and may share His sufferings, becoming like Him in His death, that by any means possible, I may attain the resurrection from the dead. May God bless the reading of His Word. Chapter 3 starts off, and the ESV version of the Bible, finally, some of your Bibles may have that. In the Greek, a good translation, or perhaps maybe even a little bit of a better one, might be, so then. So then, my brothers, but finally, my brothers, so then, my brothers, rejoice in the Lord. He's linking this back to what he's already said, what I just recapped for you. And so you should rejoice. You should rejoice that there are people like Timothy and Epaphroditus that you can look at. You should rejoice that Jesus came and humbled himself, and lived for you, and died for you. Rejoice, brothers and sisters. And look what he says. It's interesting. To write the same things to you is no trouble to me and is safe for you. It's really good for me to repeat myself to you. How many of you have somebody in your life that repeats themselves all the time? You're like, ooh. That person's with me. If they're with you, don't raise your hand right now. <laughs> we have those people at times, right? They repeat the same stories. They repeat things over and over. Sometimes that's because they've forgotten what they've told you. And so for them, they're telling it to you for the first time. And you're like, oh man, I've heard this one. Sometimes they're not really paying attention to who they're talking to. They just like to talk. And so that's the problem. But there's other times where people are repeating things to you because they're extremely important. When you were in school, some of you still are, and you were told that if there's a fire, you're supposed to do three things. If the fire happens, it's right there, you get on fire. What are you supposed to do? You're supposed to stop, drop, roll. Look at you guys. <laughs> you heard that only one time in your life, didn't you? You heard it over and over and over and over. 
The Apostle Paul here says, I'm going to write to you the same things I talked to you about when I was with you. I'm going to remind you of the Gospel of Jesus Christ. I'm going to talk to you because it's no trouble for me to talk about Jesus. It's no trouble for me to write to you about Jesus. That's how great He is and that's how important He is. And guess what? It's very safe for you to hear about Him. It's also why we take the Lord's Supper every Sunday here. It is no trouble for us to proclaim the Lord's death until He comes. It is safe for you to see the gospel display in the taking of the elements over and over and over again. But what if it gets boring and you don't understand the gospel very well? You need to hear it again and again. Real quick side note here, I have five things that might be uh, helpful or dangerous for us, and thus why it is safe for us to hear the gospel over and over again. When you get away from the gospel, Christian, listen closely to me. When you get away from the gospel, you lose your identity. You lose your identity. The gospel, the good news of Jesus, His life, His death, His resurrection on your behalf is what brings you into God's family. It makes you a child of God. Your worth is in Christ. When you forget the gospel, when you move away from the gospel, you will forget your identity. So it's safe for you to be reminded of your identity, loved one. It's the gospel that gives you purpose in life. It's dangerous for you if you forget the gospel that you will lose your purpose in this life. Your purpose is to glorify God and introduce other people to Him. Glorify God grow to look more like Jesus and introduce other people to Jesus. That's your purpose. If you get away from the Gospel, you're in danger of getting away from your purpose. The third, if you get away from the Gospel, this is dangerous for you because you will lose hope. You will lose hope. True hope is found only in Christ. Because if you put your hope in other people, Guess what? They're going to fail you. Eventually, they're going to let you down. Put your hope in a circumstance, that circumstance can change just like that. You get away from the gospel, the third thing is you will lose hope. You get away from the gospel, it is dangerous because you will forget the mission. Similar to your purpose of glorifying God, and telling others, the mission is to make disciples of all nations. Even as a church, if we get away from the gospel, we can forget that we're to be making disciples of all nations. That's the mission. If you're a soldier in the military and you forget what your country exists for, you forget the plan, you'll be in the middle of the battlefield and forget why you're there. And the fifth Danger. You can maybe think of others, but these are five that I have for you. The fifth danger when you get away from the gospel is pride. Is pride. The gospel tells you that you're an enemy of God, you're a sinner, and you need the grace of God to save you. You cannot save yourself. You're a beggar, and all we're doing in evangelism as it's been said, is we're beggars telling other beggars where we found the bread. That should keep you humble. You get away from the gospel and you become proud and think that you're better than other people. So Paul says, it is no trouble for me to remind you to say the same things to you. It's safe for you. Again, you could think of others, and I encourage you to do that tonight when you're hanging out to the late hour of 7 o'clock <laughs> eating Oreo cookies talking about why is it safe that we hear the gospel over and over and over again. In verse 2 he goes on to say look out for the dogs. Some of you cat people are like I knew it. <laughs> I knew it. The Bible talks about it. That's not what it means. Many times it's interesting for the Jewish people, the <coughs> dogs were not going to be something like pets like we would have. They would be, they would be dirty and they'd be outcast. They would be, have diseases and such. But they use that phrasing often to talk about Gentiles. 
The Gentiles would be everyone who's not Jewish. Now what's interesting is Paul's going to use this language he's going to kind of flip it on. Look out for the dogs, for the evildoers, those who mutilate the flesh. What's going on there? We know that there's been problems with people coming behind the Apostle Paul when he's gone to different churches. He preaches the gospel, establishes the churches, and then other teachers come in. Many known as the Judaizers. And they come in and they say, okay, it's it's, it's okay that you Gentiles are becoming Christians, but you also have to obey the law. And that includes circumcision. You're going to have to go and get circumcised. Because you need to to keep the law to really be one of God's people. And they were missing that it's done by faith. So the Apostle Paul here says, watch out for the dogs, which would normally mean the Gentiles, but he means those of the circumcision in the sense of they're going around trying to tell the new Christians, you're going to have to obey the law, including getting circumcised. They mutilate their flesh. He's saying, watch out, they're the dogs. They're the ones that are not worthy and right. Because they are trying to get you to depend on your works instead of the grace of God. He says, we, those who have faith, verse 3, we're of the circumcision. This is not talking about a physical circumcision. It's a spiritual one. Circumcision of the heart. Where you've been given a new heart. A heart of flesh. You have this heart of stone. And God has given you a heart of flesh. And so we worship by the Spirit of God. Not out of our flesh. But by God's Spirit. And glory in Christ Jesus. And we put no confidence in the flesh. What that means is, we're not going to try to have a list of things, and if we do these things on our own power, then God's going to love us. We put no confidence there. That will not help you. Instead, you need grace. You have faith in Christ, in His work, in His righteousness. He says, we are of the true circumcision. We don't trust in the flesh like those other ones who are coming around telling you. You need to obey the law and believe in Jesus. When it comes to the math equation of salvation, it's Jesus equals salvation. Jesus plus anything ruins everything. It's just Him. Faith in Him. And some of you may not like how that lands. You want to hear that you're good enough. You want to hear that your works are good. And when I would ask you the question, why would a holy God let you into heaven? Our friend that passed, she had her time here on earth. For all of us, it's appointed. You die, and then comes the judgment. I don't know her heart. I don't know where she stood. But that's it. She now stands before holy God. He says to her, he says to you, that's you in the car. Why do you get to go in? If it begins with anything like I did this or I think that, you are in trouble. Jesus paid it. All to Him you owe. You're saved, as R.C. Sproul talks about. You're saved by works. They're just not your works. You're saved by Jesus' works. You're in need of righteousness. The problem is you don't have any. Jesus has it. He gives it to you. So Paul says, we're, we're of the true circumcision where God, by His grace, has changed us. And so we don't put confidence in the flesh. Though... Verse 4, look what he does here. Though I myself have reason for confidence in the flesh. If anyone else thinks he has reason, I really have reason, Paul says. If you really want to compare resumes, you want to get a checklist going. Over here are the good things and over here are the bad things. You want to do that, Paul says? I got y'all. I'll smoke you. I got nothing. 
Paul says in verse 5, I was circumcised on the eighth day. So he had the fleshly circumcision. I'm of the people of Israel. Heck, I'm of the, the tribe of Benjamin. <coughs> Only two tribes that didn't go against the Davidic king. When the nation of Israel split, and ten went to the north and two went to the south, Benjamin was one of the ones that held on. I'm of that tribe. Now I'm a Hebrew of Hebrews. We spoke Hebrew in our home. We obeyed everything that we were supposed to do. As to the law, I'm a Pharisee. Not only do I obey the law, man, I put circles around the law to make sure that I don't even come close to disobeying. Speed limit says go up 45, man, I'm doing 25. I'm not even going to get close. Mom says it's time to go to bed at 10 p.m. Lights out at 9.15. I'm obeying laws that God didn't even put in the Bible. As for zeal, you want to know who's zealous, who really lives for God, who really lives and follows what he says? Oh man, as for zeal, the persecutor of the church. I'm talking about somebody who's really following God. I'm killing those people who call themselves Christians and said they were following the Messiah, and they didn't do it right, so I was killing them too. As to righteousness under the law, look what he says. <coughs> Blameless. It's not saying he was perfect. The law had things that you were to do, even if you sinned, sacrifices that would be made. So anytime he messed up, we did it right. I'm blameless, he says. You want to put your resume up against mine? Look at all these things. You got nothing. I got everything right here. And then verse 7 is. But whatever gain I had, I count as lost for the sake of Christ. You see what happened is God the Spirit opened Paul's eyes. On that road, Jesus speaks to him, knocks him down on the ground, and reveals himself to him. And Paul goes, oh man, have I got this thing wrong. All my pluses in this column are actually negatives. They actually hurt me. They actually speak against me. See, that's what the law does. The law shows you that you're in need of a Savior. Nobody can keep it except Jesus. So whatever gain I had, or at least that I thought that I had, I counted that as loss. That resume that you want to go with to Jesus and stand before Him, why you should get in, if there's anything on there, friend, anything other than the blood of Jesus, then guess what? You need to count that as loss. You need to say, uh-uh, no, no. My works, filthy rags. My best stuff stinks. <coughs> that's where you got to be. That's not where you're at, friend. You're in trouble. Jesus plus you ruins everything. Jesus for you is the Indeed, he says, I count everything as loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. I love that. I love the way that he says that. I'm going to count everything else that I've done. That is all lost. None of that matters because the worth, the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus. Notice it doesn't say knowing about Him. It's a real relationship. Really, actually knowing Him. For Him, that's worth more than anything. And so can I 
plead with you at the end of this year and the start of the next year. Whatever is in your life that is causing battle for you to know Him more. Anything that's going on, anybody that is in your life and they're pulling you away from knowing Him more, get rid of it. Get it out of your life. Get them out of your life. Get him, get her out of your life if they're not helping you know Jesus more. You need to know him more. That has to be the most important thing of anything, of any value. You have to see him, knowing him as the most gorgeous, glorious thing. Everything else doesn't matter. Look what he says. For his sake I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish. Count as trash. It doesn't matter. Get away from me. Anything that I'm trying to use to gain better standing with God, any of my works, the fact that I think I'm a good person, any of this garbage, it is garbage, and I need to get rid of it so that I can gain Christ. What he says he's doing. And to gain Christ, verse 9 continues on, and be found in him. That's what it means to gain Christ, is you're found in him. So when the Father sees you, he sees his beautiful Son. Because you're in his beautiful Son. And what's glorious about that is when you're once you're in him, you don't go out of him. Once you have the Spirit of God inside of you, it's a seal, it's a guarantee. You don't lose that. He explains it in mine. I'm going to be found in Him. Why? Not having a righteousness of my own. That comes from the law. But that which comes through faith in Christ. The righteousness from God that depends on faith. Our righteousness is an alien righteousness. It has to come from outside of us. Given to us. And it comes to us through faith. And then he repeats it in 10. This depends on faith. That I may know Him. I want to know Him. I want to know Him more. And I want to know the power of His resurrection as well. The same Spirit that raised Jesus from the dead lives inside of you, Christian. The same Spirit, the Holy Spirit that raised Him from the dead lives inside of you. You should be able to obey Him. You should be able to grow. It is a miracle for us to be saved. It's a miracle for us to look more and more like Jesus. But guess what? You have God living inside of you. You can grow. Make this a year of gain, of, of, of loss, of the garbage, and gain of Christ. Press in deeper and deeper and deeper into Him. As I was talking to you, telling you about the guy, I know what you're thinking. He's a good for nothing something. He doesn't love her. He doesn't love her. He don't want to spend time with her. He don't want to talk to her and hear from her like pray and listen. He didn't want to spend time with her family or friends, kind of like gathering with God's people. He doesn't even want to read the book that she gave him that explains all that he would need to know about her. Our husband did that. We're the bride of Christ, are we not? Did he not give us the book? What do you want to know about him? Some of you, you're not really interested in being with God's people. You're not really interested in talking with God. You're not interested in hearing from God. You're not interested in reading and pressing in deeper and deeper and deeper to know Jesus. I'm not talking about a season. We all have the battles, right? The season where we don't have that and we feel conviction and God works and we come back. If you're down there right now, cry out and say, God, bring me back. 
bring me back. Bring me here. Let's get going. Let's get back there. I want to be back there. If you've never felt that, you don't know him. Because he's so incredible. Like, if you're here and you don't know him, I wish I could just explain him to you in such a way that you could understand how wonderful he is. You would just want to know more and more and more. I one time had a church member say to me, I don't really want to learn more or go deeper. I just want Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so to be enough. I want a childlike faith. Now, does the Bible say we're to have a childlike faith? Yeah. But it doesn't mean that you don't press in and grow in your knowledge and love for God. That's the only way you can grow. Because the Spirit of God needs to renew your mind and teach you as you press deeper and deeper and deeper into who God is. And that's what Paul's right. He says, I want to know Him. I want to know the power of His resurrection. That, that power that changes lives. I want Him to change me that way. And then look what He says. And some of us aren't going to like this one either. Verse 10, that I may know Him in the power of His resurrection and share His... What's the word? Becoming like Him in His death. The Apostle Paul isn't like some psycho that's like, oh, I just want to suffer because I like suffering. I just like pain. That's not what we're talking about here, friends. There's a depth to knowing Christ that only comes through suffering. Some of you are there right now. Some of you are suffering right now. And my prayer for you is that you are tasting the sweetness of God in this time. The one who has suffered just like you are suffering. And so thus, he is a high priest who can identify with you. Friend, if you do not have a desire to know him so badly that it, it doesn't matter if it takes suffering, I want more Jesus. It's not you. you leave today without asking God to make that you. I want to become like him. I want to share in his sufferings. Why? So I can know him more. That's what true salvation is. Salvation isn't getting out of hell. It's not even just walking on streets of gold. Eternal life is knowing God and His Son. That's what eternal life is. And so Paul ends this section by saying that by any means possible, I may attain the resurrection from the dead. There's some discussion on exactly what does he mean by that. It could mean that by however I die, it doesn't matter, I want the resurrection from the dead. Or, and I would lean more this way, He's saying, I want to suffer if I need to. I want to live the life I need to. I want to do whatever I have to do to have the resurrection from the dead. Yes, there is a certainty that we have in the Scriptures. And there's some passages you read it and it's like very clear. He will not lose you. Right? And then there's other passages that we read and it's like, wait, don't make a shipwreck of your faith. Keep pressing on. Don't give up. Wait, I thought I, thought I won't lose my salvation. What's going on? You need to hear different things at different times. And I think here in Philippians, you're seeing both. He has you, but don't be sitting out there being presumptuous. Don't be thinking, I don't really want the sufferings. I'm okay not reading his book. I'm okay not really praying and talking to him. But you know what? I'm good. Don't be doing it. It's dangerous. Be like Paul. Whatever it takes, I want to know him. So that by any means possible, I will have the resurrection from the dead. Let's pray together. Father, we do thank you for this passage of your word. We thank you for the fact that the Apostle Paul wrote this letter under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit so many years ago, encouraging them to press on. Encouraging them not to look within themselves for righteousness, but to look to Christ. And so, God, I pray for those who are here, Lord, that anyone in here who has been thinking that they have the right resume, that that gain in their lives is going to give them some kind of standing, I pray today they would see it as loss and cry out for the righteousness of Christ as a gift. For the rest of us, Lord, who's already done that, remind us of these same things 
so we don't lose our identity, our purpose, our hope, our mission, or become proud. Lord, help us to know Jesus more. Help us to understand and walk in the power of His resurrection. And Lord, help us to share in His sufferings well. And may we do it all for Your glory and our good. In Jesus' name, amen. But ask those who are helping with the Lord's Supper to please come forward now and help prepare the Lord's Supper. As I said, during the sermon, we take the Lord's Supper every week to proclaim the Lord's death. As a reminder, something for us to see, we sing about the Gospel, we pray the Gospel, we read the Scriptures that have the Gospel in them, and we preach the Gospel, and then we also see it on display with the Lord's Supper. And so what we'd like to do is have you take a few moments now and ask the Lord to search your heart, things you've been hearing, things you've been reading, things you've been singing, and repent from anything that you need to repent of, and then take the Lord's Supper in good conscience. This is for those who are followers of Jesus. If you're a baptized follower of Jesus, uh, you're, you've obeyed Him in baptism, and so now you're following Him, then this is for you to take. But if you're not a follower of Jesus, and this is just something for you to observe as we take it together. So take a few minutes now, ask God to search your heart, and we prepare things up here. Paul's other letter to the church of Corinth in chapter 11 he writes to them concerning the Lord's Supper and he says this, For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus on the night when he was betrayed took bread and when he had given thanks he broke it and said, This is my body which is for you do this in remembrance of me. In the same way also he took the cup after supper saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup you proclaim the Lord's death comes. For those of you who are guests, what we'll do is we'll actually come forward, so we'll start in the wings and then work our way back uh, row by row by few. While you're waiting your turn, feel free to read scripture over the congregation. Uh, it's an encouragement to hear God's word as we come forward. Do this, so. uh, if you cannot make it up, we can bring it to you after everybody else is gone. <laughs> You have come to the assembly of God's firstborn children, whose names are written in heaven. You have come to God Himself, who is the judge over all things. You have come to the Spirit, the righteous ones in heaven, who have now been made perfect. Our God, rest my salvation, and the glory of my mighty rock, my refuge is God, trusting Him at all times, O people. Pour out your heart before Him. God is a refuge for us.
Go ahead and stand together and respond with the top song. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above the heavenly host. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Amen. All right, thank you for being here this morning. Again, don't forget the library area over there. If you have, uh, if you don't give anything, give online or drop things in the boxes before you go. Uh, remember, tonight, no Bible study, no biblical counseling training. You're going to hang out with each other, eat Oreos at 7 o'clock, correct? <laughs> Here's a blessing for you before you go out of the book of First Peter. Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, so that at the proper time He may exalt you, casting all your anxieties on Him because He cares for you. Be sober-minded, be watchful. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour. Resist him. Firm in your faith, knowing that the same kinds of suffering are being experienced by your brotherhood throughout the world. And after you have suffered a little while, the God of all grace, who has called you to his eternal glory in Christ, will himself restore, confirm, strengthen, and establish you. To him be the dominion forever and ever. Amen. Amen. Have a blessed day, everybody.